this exhibition that's at the Metropolitan is a gigantic show. Surrealism Beyond Borders is, um, it's really a, a, it's not a, it's not exactly a comprehensive show. What it is, is it is um, exploring um, uh, artists that don't get quite as much exposure and haven't been seen in a show like this. Um, many of them are, were really un uh, unfamiliar, at least to me. And so it's a really interesting exhibition. Um, but what I'm going to do is I'm going to start off with um, a bit of background on surrealism and dataism. So let me let me just read you this this bit and then we'll move on. Uh, surrealism was a revolutionary idea sparked in Paris around 1924 that asserted the unconscious and dreams over the familiar and the everyday. While surrealism could generate often poetic, even humorous works. It was also taken up as a far more serious weapon in the struggle for political, social, and personal freedom by many artists around the world. And the, uh, the piece um, that's on this page right here, the baton blows, was actually from a a riot that took place in Egypt. Um, but I will speak more about this one later. What I'm gonna do is move us to the next page, which gives you a little glimpse of what the installation looks like at, at, the, at the net. It is a big, dense show fo focusing on many of the lesser known artists, but also integrating, you know, some really well-known ones also uh, into, into the mix. Um, Max Ernst is a very well-known surrealist. Uh, um, but, but one of the things that the curators wanted to focus on was women artists, um, African, South American, Central American, Asian artists who all, and American, artists who all took up the, the, the surrealist notion and, and carried it forward. Okay, so the line between dataism, the dataist movement and surrealism is hazy at best. Data began in, in 1916, as I talked about at our last, uh, thing with Sophie Tober Arp, she was a dataist, and so was Jean Arp or Hans Arp, her husband. Uh, they were, you know, basically fundamental in the start of the dataist movement. So, Dada began in 1916 in Zurich, and uh, by 1920 it had spread to Paris, where surrealism asserted itself in 1924. Both data and surrealism share revolutionary zeal um, in reaction to World War I. Um, the art of the movement spanned visual, literary, sound, media, um, uh, including collage, um, sound poetry, um, cut up writing, um, sculpture, dadaist, artists express their discontent with violence, war, nationalism, and maintain political affinities with the radical left-wing politics. Um, surrealism used many of the same techniques and added a few twists. The, the movement expanded in different forms throughout the world. And this big assemblage piece is a, a piece by Kurt Schwitter, which is, you know, to me, it's quite a beautiful abstract piece, but it was shocking back then that that you know that we were that they were using you know found objects and 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 you know newspaper and things like that as as a fine art uh, media. Okay, um, if you have any questions, put them in the chat, 
and I will try to get to them. I'll, I'll check every once in a while. Um, I'm not going to be as good at this part of it uh, since Joan is not here, but uh, do the best I can. Okay. With more Cell Duchamp's ready-mades, the idea that the artist's mind became more important than the art object. Um, the data artists rejected logic, reason, and aestheticism of modern society. Instead, they use intuition and improvisation in their work. So what you see here is, um, is really um, Duchamp started to explore these ideas before before World War I and after World War I, he really um, uh, pushed this. And he's the link between Dada and surrealism in, in a number of ways. Um, so what you see here is, is kind of his evolution from cubism into uh, a more conceptual art. So, you know, he signs this urinal our mutt and puts it out there on a pedestal as a sculpture. And it's the idea of the art more than it is what the object is. Um, again, it's this, it's this business of uh, anti-materialism. Um, you, you, know, you can buy the urinal if that's what you wanna do, but he's really interested more in the idea than in the object, okay? And then there are two different portraits down below taken by Man Ray, who was another surrealist artist, um, an American surrealist artist. And you're gonna see a number of photographs that he took in the next few slides. But here we have portrait of, of Marcel Duchamp and portrait of Marcel Duchamp as Rose c'est la vie, uh, and you know he he donned this drag costume, and um, you know basically he was questioning everything. He was questioning all of our limits. He was questioning the 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 notions that that we that we hold um, in as many different ways as he possibly could. Um, in I believe in French, the slang or the interpretation of, of Rose C'est la Vie is the erotic is life. Um, that's my understanding of that translation. Now, uh, there, there could be somebody out there who speaks French and would have a different interpretation, but I'm gonna go with that. Okay. So the Surrealists are best known for uh, visual artworks and a number of the photographs that you see here are of Andre Breton uh, taken by Man Ray and Man Ray was experimenting with different kinds of photography. Um, so best known for visual artworks uh, and writings, which juxtapose images that activate the unconscious mind. Artists painted unnerving illogical scenes, sometimes with photographic precision, creating strange creatures from everyday objects and developing painting techniques that allowed the unconscious to express itself. The aim, according to uh, leader Andre Breton, was to resolve the, the previously contradictory condition of dream and reality into an absolute reality, a super reality, or surreality. Okay. On the left, you see a drawing, which is called the exquisite corpse. And, and it, it's a technique that the, that the surrealists use. What they do is fold a piece of paper and they'll do a drawing and leave some lines on the edge and then fold the paper over and pass it on to another artist or another person to continue the drawing. So you get these juxtaposed drawings that are by these different things. Now, one of the, where the exquisite 
corpse came from was a, a collaborative writing exercise that happened when they first tried this, this drawing with words and images. And the line that came out in one of the drawings was the exquisite corpse will drink the new wine. <laughs> uh, no attempts to shovel a glimpse into what that one means. <laughs> okay. Um, one technique was to use the uncanny as an access point to explore one's reactions. So this, this um, iron with the nails uh, welded onto it was created by Man Ray. Um, and just the idea of, you know, the thing looks really dangerous. Uh, what's it gonna do if you try and iron something with it? Um, it, 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 it questions how you think about things. What's the function of this? Uh, what do these things remind you of? What's it, you know, and so, in Sigmund Freud's essay, The Uncanny in 1919, um, defined the idea as an instance when something can be familiar and yet alien at the same time. So one of the few Dali pieces that, that is included in the show is this lobster telephone. Uh, I'd never seen it before. If, if you had told me that was a Dali, I would have said, well, I, I don't know. <laughs> so um, it's, uh, it, they, they chose interesting pieces for the show. Um, so the movements Artists find magic and strange beauty in, unex in the unexpected, the disregarded, the unconventional. At the core of their work is a willingness to challenge imposed values and norms and search for freedom. The word surrealist suggesting beyond reality um, was coined by the French avant-garde poet uh, Polinaire in a preface uh, to a new grouping of poets and artists in Paris. Um, his, you know, basically uh, Breton, who was, was another poet, wrote a manifesto. And in this manifesto, he asserted that pure psychic automatism by which one proposes to express either verbally in writing or in any other manner, the real functioning of thought. Dictation of thought in the absence of all control exercised by reason outside all aesthetic or moral preoccupation. Now that's a mouthful. The idea behind this is to really liberate and allow, you know, it's kind of like the whole associ association business that, that uh, Sigmund Freud was, was into. Um, so free association, allowing whatever comes out to come out and see where it goes. Okay. Automatism as a term is borrowed from physiology where it describes bodily movements that are not consciously controlled like breathing or sleepwalking. Sigmund Freud used free association, automatic drawing or writing to explore the unconscious mind of his patients. Many surrealist artists have used <clears throat> automatic drawing or writing to unlock ideas and images from their unconscious minds. Others have wanted to depict the dream world or the hidden psychological tensions. Uh, surrealist artists have drawn inspiration from mysticism, ancient cultures, indigenous art and knowledge as a way of imagining alternative realities. Breton and others produced 
early examples of, of automatism in their automatic writing, aiming to write as rapidly as possible without intervening <clears throat> in, uh, consciously to guide the hand. So, you know, this Henry Michel piece is very much, you know, the, the idea of just letting the marks flow. Um, you can see that this had an impact on abstract painting in the future, you know, abstract expressionists, Jackson Pollock, um, many of the, the, the movement that came after this were really affected by these ideas uh, and integrated into it. Jean Miro, again, another, another one who used this kind of, you know, splatter and then, and then, you know, juxtaposition of different types of mark making in the same image. Okay, frottage is a method that basically what you do is you take a piece of paper, you put it down over a textured surface and you rub over it with a pencil and that, that image comes through onto the paper. Uh, Rotage is another technique they used, uh, and this is Max Ernst's piece, uh, where they put oil paint on, on a, um, a canvas and put that over a textured surface and scrape off the paint. And that's where you get the textural um, remnants that, that start the painting and then you work over that and into it. Okay. Now, these are more of the exquisite corpse drawings and this is by Frida Kahlo and, and um, Lucien Block, um, and they basically did these drawings together. They would fold them over and then continue the drawing, to each, each of them adding the next thing. Um, you know, Paris was, had been the epicenter of the artistic movements like Impressionism, Fauvism, Cubism, and naturally Surrealism. So the French capital became a destination for aspiring artists of all stripes during the first half of the 20th century and in the post-war era. But the ideas spread across the globe through that, that, that kind of pollination. And, you know, Frida um, was very much a, involved in carrying this surrealist notion forward. Um, so these, these exquisite corpse collaborative drawings were things that were done a lot and are still being done. As a matter of fact, I know a number of people that are involved in, in projects very similar to this. Um, and Carla Ray Johnson uh, is having, there's, there's a group show that's opening tomorrow at the, the Peekskill field, at the Field Library. Uh, which is really a collaborative project amongst a lot of artists. So interesting, and the notions are still being being explored that were started back in in the early part of the 20th century. Okay, two Fridas, very powerful image, um, and uh, this was painted after her divorce from Diego Rivera. Uh, the women artists involved in the, in the surrealist movement were much more personal, um, at times diaristic, um, uh, approaching their, their imagery from a very, you know, this is a very experiential thing. Now, one of the things that, that, that I wanted to talk about here is, is basically, um, the the two images here you know she's dressed in this kind of indigenous costume in the figure on the right and more of a a civilized cultured costume on 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 the left um the the wound the pain the open uh vein in 
in the civilized um, costume and the civilized Frida um, and the more powerful grounded figure of the, the, the in, indigenous Frida, you know, there it's, it's like, it's like the, the hand, the hand is being held by the, by the, by the more rooted figure. Um, really interesting, you know, the, the black, the dark, the colorful and the white, um, the really powerful stuff. And, and, you know, if you, if you know Frida Kahlo's work, you know, this is typical of her uh, exploration. So uh, we move on to Alice Rohan and this tribute to, to uh, Frida, ballad for Frida. Frida, Frida dies, oh, let's see, I um, uh, don't have her years down here, but I believe she died in 1954. So this, is, this was after Frida's passing. Um, this abstracted carnival procession of musicians, dancers, and fantastic creatures celebrate Frida. Um, magic, shamanism, archaic reverie, mysticism, and arcane metaphors mixed together in the Mexican and Latin American brew of surrealism. So if you look into this piece, you can see these like owl-like creatures and cats and giraffe-like creatures. And you know, you see you can see the musicians and the dancers in the foreground, and they're, you know, there's this, there's this Ferris wheel atop a Mayan temple. You know, it's it's really rich and full and mysterious and atmospheric. Fascinating stuff. Um, I really love this piece. Um, okay, so we'll move on. And into the, the Latin American, the Haitian um, um, uh, island, island, you know, the voodoo business and, and um, symbols, kind of folk art, um, abstract. Um, and, and, you know, this was, this was all part of the, the, um, the integration of, of, of these things into, into the surrealist movement. And the the um, the the version the different versions of how the cultures integrate these ideas. Okay, and then there's um, Carrington, Lenora Carrington, um, British um, artist who immigrated to Mexico. Um, uh, and basically pre-World War II, um, and she stayed, she stayed in Mexico. Um, really interesting, you know, this, this kind of hyena-like creature in this room with her and the, the rocking horse that kind of like, you know, it's like civilization, you ride it, you don't get anywhere. And then outside the window, there's this, there's this, this running free spirit of this white horse, this liberated soul uh, flying off into the distance. And then on on the on the right, you have this business of the tarot and and the occult, the the you know. Carrington's work integrated a lot of these kinds of symbolic images and, and you know, demons and, 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 and various kinds of, of um, creatures, spiders, 
creepy stuff, really. But 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 exploring the the darker realms of of our consciousness. Now I'm showing you, you know, a bunch of stuff here. There's a lot more of the of the the creepy stuff in this show. Um, I, I I tend I tend towards you know including some of that in, but but there's there's a lot more about um, about dream imagery that's involved in this thing than than um, just the shock value. Um, Okay, and now we move we move back to Paris. Uh, this is a photograph by Dora Maar, uh, who was Picasso's lover for a, a long period of time, from the around thirty six until close to I think nineteen forty thirty eight forty something like that. I can't remember now. Um, on the on the left is a is a portrait of Dora Mar by Man Ray, and then you have this this weeping woman, which is uh, uh, one of the pieces that he did of Dora Mar. Um, so, and again. The crossover between Cubism and and surrealism and expressionism and all that stuff, it's it all gets kind of mixed together in a in a batch at at a certain point. You know, we're talking 1937 at at this time. There's a lot of anxiety in the world. Um, you know, war is is cranking up, and and there's there's a lot going on in, in, in Europe at that time. Um, so one of the reasons I wanted to, I wanted to focus on Dora Maar is she is one of those artists who actually was, did these kind of surrealistic photographs before she met uh, Picasso and, and you know, I will speak for myself. I barely knew anything about her photography and those pieces. Now that's my that's my loss. But what what I would say is she was quite a remarkable artist in and of herself. And and after um, her break with Picasso, she continued to make really fantastic collage pieces. And 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 she was a painter. Um, so Duramar and, and Picasso were sitting with uh, another artist um, uh, and, and her name was, was, was Merritt and Merritt had on a, a fur bracelet that, that she had made. And Picasso said, Wow, that's 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 a fascinating thing. You could cover anything with fur. And Merritt picked up a teacup and said, "Yes, you could even coat this in in fur." And she she thought that was a really interesting idea. And here she is, Merritt Ackerman. I had seen this image. It's in the art books and all that. I never knew that it was Merritt Oppenheim's piece. Um, now, Merritt Oppenheim is quite the, quite the artist and quite the person. She, she actually um, uh, sat for this collaborative photograph by Man Ray and her focus on on really feminist issues is something that that carried on throughout her whole career um really interesting stuff woman as object well <laughs> um so we have these shoes trust up 
uh, with kind of like, you know, the ends, the ends with this paper stuff, kind of like what you get when you go to a fancy restaurant and the ends of a, of a, uh, a, a, a chicken leg is covered with one of those things. So you don't get grease on your fingers. Um, but the whole thing of these being trussed up and the kind of like, you know, bondage aspect of these shoes, um, really interesting stuff. You know, she's really an explorer and, and, there is actually a major survey of her work, the first that I know of, but the first major museum uh, show is going to tour the world. It's, it's going to end up, it was put together with um, uh, oh, Kunst Museum, I believe, but I'm not 100% certain about that, but I know the Tate and the Museum of Modern Art have, have collaborated on putting together this survey of her work, which is going to be touring in 2022. So we are going to hear more from uh, Merritt Oppenheim, and I will be talking about her again. Um, <clears throat> but one of the things that I wanted to, that I also wanted to focus on here is, is this business of this photograph that Man Ray took, and she became the darling of the of the the uh, surrealist all boys club, uh, but she definitely stood up on her own and on her hind legs and said, "You know what? This is you know, I'm here <laughs> and I'm I'm out to assert myself." And and she was in one of the one of the few women that were included in all the surrealist shows at the time. Okay. And I'm going to move on. And these are two more pieces by Merritt Oppenheim. Uh, this table with the with the chicken legs. I mean, that's really fabulous. And if you if you notice on the top of the table, you see the footprints, the chicken footprints. <laughs> the chicken or whatever kind of bird that is. I'm saying chicken. It's not a chicken. It's uh, some substantial bird. Um, and this spiral column from uh, 1983, uh, she died in, in 1985. So this spiral column fountain um, in Switzerland was one of her late pieces. Really, you know, a fabulous artist, very bright. Anyway, uh, I'm going to move on because we've got a lot more to cover. Uh, let's see. Okay. Though initially uh, a surrealist painter, Victor Brunner, um, uh, moved away from the style and began to explore his interest in native cultures and myth, um, now uh, problematically called primitivism, uh, using ink and encaustic which is a wax uh, material. Um, uh, Brunner creates a cast of colorful characters set against an animal-shaped background, um, standing on a, a green ground and blue sky, combining the cult figures of uh, oceanic art, uh, with animal skin tapestries and depictions of stories of several Native American tribes, Brunner creates an imaginary pantheon of deities, heroes, and mythological creatures, all within the borders of the horse or cow um, shaped animal, um, perhaps a sacred animal or supreme deity. Prelude to Civilization could be read as an imaginary creation story uh, to an imaginary culture set in a cave or animal hide. It's left up to the viewer to create the connections and the stories that bring these whimsical figures together. 
it's, it's a very, very funny piece. I mean, if you look at these, these characters that are in here, it's really beautiful, beautiful color, but also really funny. I mean, what are these characters about? Um, and, you know, just merging together cultures from all around the world. It's really a remarkable piece. And I, I love his work. I've looked at more of his stuff since I saw this piece and he's quite a remarkable fellow. Um, okay. So, okay. Um, this piece is from Japan and it's, it was done in 1929. So there's this rapid industrialization and militarization of, of Japan. So there's a, there's, you know, this kind of juxtaposition of the, this, you know, uh, kind of delightful uh, um, Western bathing beauty with these kind of like for, kind of sinister forces of, of industrial manufacturing and then there's this submarine and there's the the sailboat off in the distance so it's this combination of of really odd um, um, mechanized and organic um, images and and if you know anything about the um the de Curico and the, the metaphysical movement of, of uh, Italy, there was, the, there was this whole kind of um, um, mechanized and metaphoric um, relationship to the industrial and, and the mechanization, the isolation. Uh, okay, let me move on. All right. So this abstracted painting features two bird-like beings flying across the night sky. Their bodies are ornately rendered in white dots. Um, it, this is this fellow was from Ethiopia, um, and he. Um, came to Paris and was exposed to the surrealists. So he kind of int integrated what he learned and what he got from the, from the surrealists into his culture and tried to paint something that, that really represented the Ethiopian spirit that he carried. Um, really fascinating, beautifully painted thing heavily textured, um, you know, the, the oil paint, the use of the paint is really lovely. Um, and we're going to keep moving, moving along here because I see that I'm, I'm, <laughs> I'm talking too much. Um, okay, so um, the, this pie bird, haunting images, both of these, uh, you know, um, the, the phantoms, this is in 1934. So, you know, you can, there's, there's things afoot in the culture that, that I think these ghost-like images portend. It's beautifully painted. You know, this is one that, that both my wife and I were, you know, taken why. Um, and this pie bird piece, it is really an incredible piece. Again, um, the integration of cubism and, and, and surrealism are, are, you know, hard to separate in, in some of these pieces. Um, you know, I haven't shown any of, of Salvador Dali's work um, I think you all know his work, and he took um, a very traditional track in painting and t 
turned it into something that was that was quite extraordinary in his own way. Um, but you know, the, these pieces are um, more things that we haven't seen or associated with with surrealism. So that's kind of where the where the focus comes. Okay. And as I said, it can be pretty creepy. Now, you know, Hieronymus Bosch, the Garden of Earthly Delights, this is a detail from it. You know, you can see how, you know, this has been in the culture. This nightmare brew in, in our psyches is something that's been there for a very long time. And uh it's, um, you know, the, the, the photograph of, of the manatee on the right by Dora Maar is quite remarkable. This is a baby manatee. Who the heck would know that? But it looks like some kind of mutant thing that came out of a radioactive wasteland. Uh, and then there's this, there's this crazy thing on, on the left. Now, this is from Japan, um, an artist that, that, you know, really was... was uh, I don't have a date on this one, which would be really interesting to see what what relationship that was to the atomic bomb. But hey, just a little a little aside. Um, okay, one of the few recognized female surrealists, uh, Remedios Varo, was a Spanish painter known for her meticulous dreamlike paintings. Varro evoked the icon iconography of various sources, Renaissance, allegory, uh, Catholic, and Sufi mysticism, and Jungian psychology. Um, she was born in 1908. Um, so, you know, basically she, she, um, she had a long lifespan, but these really beautiful painted pieces are haunting. Um, they're, they're fairly large scale too. Um, let's see if I can push this thing out of my way. I can't, all right. Um, I can't, I can't ac actually, you can probably see her dates better than I can right now, but this was painted in 1961. Um, actually, I think all three of, yeah, all three of the pieces that were in the show were painted in, in 1961. There are fairly large scale pieces. Um, I don't know how long it took her to paint them, but you can see this, this business of alchemy, um, the idea of, of, you know, these medieval scribes taking down this information from this, this alchemical brew that they're being fed. And the, the, the scrolls are coming out the windows because there's so much information that they're feeding into, into these scrolls. You know, it's really beautiful, really incredibly painted pieces. And there's a, the, the René Magritte on the, on the left is in the show, time transfixed. Um, so there's this dreamlike element and, and you know, that this, this business of realism and, and, you know, how precise many of his paintings are. So on the right, I threw in, this is not a pipe. Um, that's what it says in French. So we're looking at this picture of a pipe. So what is he saying to us? It's a painting of a pipe. <laughs> so uh, yes, and and uh, what's that that Freudian thing? Sometimes a cigar is just a cigar. Well, okay. <laughs> uh, all right. Um, now this fellow. Um, Alchinsky was part of a movement uh, called the Cobra Movement, the Cobra 
um, painters came out of um, basically, um, uh, let's see, they were, they were trying to integrate, you know, primitive, um, uh, the art of the insane, the, the whole notion, the buffet was kind of the patron saint of the, of, of this group of painters. And this painting was painted from Central Park in 1965. And if you look at the little, the little pictures around the edges of this thing, and look at these kind of denizens of Central Park that you see around the outside loop of this, they're quite remarkable. As a matter of fact, I'm gonna, I'm gonna see if I can pull up the zoom so that we can look at some of these characters a little bit more closely. You know, you see these, you know, skeletal creatures and then, you know, there's walking the dog and then there's the, these other toothless characters with uh, <laughs> some, some other thing going on. There's, there's a really interesting kind of, you know, narrative that he did of these pieces, of these, of, of these characters that you find in the denizens of Central Park. <laughs> um, really funny, very colorful, very bright, bold. It's a, it's a fairly large piece too. It's, it's, um, I'd say it's at least, um, four by six feet or something like that, or five by six feet, something like that. Um, and that's in the show. Okay. Displacement is very much a part of something that the, that the surrealists addressed. And, you know, if you look at this collage on, on the right, this is from September of 1941. What was going on, it, you know, what was happening for the Dutch? You know, the movement that the unsettled quality, the, the, um, the, the war really broke down culture in a way and uh, interesting. Um, and on, on the left, you have a visa without a planet. Um, so th this fellow was from Baghdad um, and uh, this was from 1983 to 1990 that this piece was put together. I'd be curious to see some of the other pages in, 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 the, in the, uh, the passport. Um, okay, so we're gonna move on. Again, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm running late, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna try and speed through this, but photography played a very important part in, in, in surrealism. And the idea, the notion that that um, that a photograph is a document, a a a um, kind of realistic portrayal of what you're seeing, and yet it can take on these really symbolic and and interesting. Uh, um, forces. So you see this Korean painting from 19, uh, a photograph from 1949, and basically that's a post Japanese, um, you know, the Japanese had been there for, for many years. So, you know, what is the saying about the, the burial, the corpse like, uh, uh, you know, this reaching out of the earth of the of the dead um still life <laughs> um and you know these pieces over here the the uh, on the on the left are from um two of them are from colombia and and you know the the unrest that was taking place at that time um the the women's faces are covered you know 
So these experimental photographs were really important and interesting. Um, I'm, I'm gonna keep moving because we've got more to cover. Okay, this piece was the piece that I, I showed right at the beginning. And, and really this was, this was about the baton blows. This was about a riot that took place in, in Egypt. Um, uh, in, and this, is, this painting really talks about the, the, the political strife that was taking place in Egypt at that time. Uh, so really the, this cubistic interpretation of, of, of that experience is something that, the, that this artist really captured. Okay. The movement, um, there's an anti-colonial aspect to surrealism. And, and um, this fellow really kind of captured that, that the idea of the anxiety that was, that was in um, uh, Mozambique at that time. Um, now, this is, this is 1967, the Portuguese um, were, you know, stepping out of their imperialist uh, role in, in, in the country. Um, but the, there's, there's this sense of anxiety that's in it. Um, and it's like the nightmares are, are right outside the door. Um, okay, and again, you know, this is a very expressionistic painting. You know, if you told me that this was a surrealist painting, I would accept that. But uh, it looks to me like, you know, uh, some of the German expressionists. Uh, so, and this is um, uh, Ted Jones, um, very much uh, involved in, in this exquisite corpse business where he, he would take this, these, um, this is like a, basically hundreds of artists participated in this 30 foot long exquisite corpse um, uh, piece, which is in the show. Um, so it, it scrolls out and they've got it in this giant vitrine so you can follow, follow the piece along. And there, there were people, um, like the, the artist who just did that last piece who participated, um, uh, Malanga Tana and, and, and John Ashbery, um, uh, people like that star. Um, there's just too many people to mention at this point, but um, uh, these pieces that are on this page are all by Ted Jones, um, Bird Lives, he very much improvisational, very much about jazz. That profoundly influenced him. Um, so as a young man, he was exposed to surrealism, a young black man, and followed that as his, as his way into the art. Um, Bird Lives, okay. And I'm gonna finish up with a couple of Japanese artists. One you will definitely have heard of, Kusama. Um, and the piece, on, the piece on the right is, is basically a Kusama uh, piece. It's, it's mixed media, it's heavily textured, probably some encaustic or something like that that she used the wax medium on, on the paper. Uh, very, you know, um, a lot like um, Joan Miro, uh, that kind of um, biomorphic characters, but very moody and very much her own. 
Um, and then this piece on the, on the, on the left is uh, a diagram of the I Ching um, done in 1941, Japan. So it's very interesting to see something like this at a time of such turmoil. Um, Japan had been at war for how long at that point? I don't, I, I didn't check my history before I got on, but um, it's a very interesting piece to see in relationship to what was going on in the culture at the time. So let's see if there are any chat things here. I thought I'd read that Kalo, uh, while exhibiting with the Surrealists, did not consider herself to be a Surrealist, uh, Surrealist artist. Your thoughts? Well, yeah, I, I agree with that. Um, she, though she did use the techniques, um, the exquisite corpse was something which was really created by Breton. So she was, I, I, I never, you know, it's so personal, her work. And so, um, uh, unique that, that, uh, in, in the category of what the curators put together for this show, um, she loosely fits into that and adds to the mixture. So let's put it that way. I, I would say that she does de deal with the, the subconscious, the unconscious and, and her images definitely have that, that power in them to access the unconscious. So in that sense, she's a surrealist. Um, okay, so I have a couple of YouTubes that I, that I set up here. They're both from the Metropolitan. There are other YouTubes online that you can check out that are um, really interesting. You know, there was one from 1978, didn't deal with any of the women, um, but it was an interesting, you know, um, uh, peace and worth worth watching there's a lot of stuff on youtube you know you know how that is uh, so this uh this map of of the world was put together by uh, a belgian magazine um back in 1929 and uh, left out left left out and included a lot of interesting um places <laughs> look at the size of alaska and where's America in there? <laughs> anyway, uh, so that is it for, for this. The Surrealism show is, is really dense. There's a lot there. Um, there's a lot to love and a lot to hate in it, in it all. Um, I found that, that there were a lot of revelations for me in it and people who I'd, I'd never really seen. So um, the next time that we meet will be on the, I believe it's the 4th of December, it's either the 3rd or the 4th, the 3rd. Um, and and um, I'm gonna be covering um, an artist by the name of Stanley Whitney, who is having a show right now, and Saul LeWitt. And they could not be more different from one another in their conceptual approaches to their work, um, but, but the color is something that, that has some great kinships. So it should be an interesting talk. And um, that's it. Have a great Thanksgiving and I'll see you.